but hearing everything. That's And that's what I would say is the core of what we're about as a firm. Business of Architecture, episode 410. Hello, Architect Nation, and welcome to this episode of The Business of Architecture. I'm Enoch Sears, and today's interview is an interview with Ryan Willard, and Ryan is speaking with Joseph Spear, who's the owner of California-based architecture firm Joseph Spear Architects. Joseph grew up in Los Angeles County, received his architecture degree from the University of Arizona School of Architecture, and got his architecture license in the state of California. After interning with and then working for several leading Southern California architecture firms, Joseph Spear decided to launch his own practice. In this episode, Joseph gives a little glimpse of how the firm operates, how they win work, how they mitigate risk from onboarding clients in the design process, and what for him makes a successful team. You'll also hear him discuss the valuable skill of deep listening and how it's instrumental in bringing products to life in a personal way. If you do custom residential work or you work with commercial clients, you'll find this interview with Joseph Spear to be very, very informative, very educational. We hope you love it. And as always, carpe diem. Here is today's show. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Joseph, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Absolute pleasure. Now, you are the founder and uh, the managing director, if you like, of Joseph Spear Architects. Um, That's right. You've got a beautiful portfolio of residential um, work, and there's a number of commercial projects there as well. You're based in, um, in California on the Pacific, beautiful views, not what we get here in the UK. Um, <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, it's, it's really quite a, a, a solid portfolio of residential um, projects. Um, how did you begin? How, was the, how did you first start building these, these projects and get, in, get the ball rolling, if you like? Well, so, you know, out of college, I worked for a few excellent architecture firms. So when I graduated, I worked for a high-end custom single family residential firm um, in Los Angeles and uh, did that for a few years and then moved on to a, a multifamily and commercial office. I was looking for varied experience. So I always knew that I wanted to start my own architecture mm-hmm. practice the question was just kind of when and how, right? So, yeah. um, so the second firm was a commercial multifamily and highly technical and detail oriented. Uh, and, a, you know, it was a great experience too. And then right from there, once I got my architecture license, after I passed all the, um, the tests, uh, then I immediately started my practice. And I started in 2009 um, right at the height of the, uh, the Great Recession. I remember um, it well. Yeah. So my, my first project was a closet. We moved the wall about three feet. Yeah. Uh, and that was my glorious first project. And it was all very exciting. Um, and then from there, our projects just got kind of bigger and more complex and more interesting. So we're no, we're no longer moving a wall uh, you know, a few feet. So why, why 2009? Obviously that's a, um, quite an interesting period in the architectural industry and in construction in, you know, everything basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of businesses that were created at that time. Was this out of necessity that the business was created or were you, it just felt like this was the right time. You jumped into it. Was, it? it was the time. So, so basically, um, you know, I, I graduated in 2006 from architecture school you're required to do a three-year internship. Mm -hmm. um, And during that internship, you're required to uh, pass 10 tests, nine national and one California. I think it's a little different now than it was back then, but um, at least back when I took it, it was 10 tests. And uh, right when I passed that final test in 2009 is when I decided to open the practice. So I wasn't waiting around. I didn't want to 
you know, in fact, I remember turning to my then boss and saying, I, I have to go start my own practice. And he said, what are you crazy? You should be appreciative that you have a job right now. <laughs> and I said, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going for it anyway. Yeah. So if it were a different economy, maybe my first project wouldn't have been a closet, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I could, I, you know, I was nimble. I had no, I had zero overhead at that point. So I could take on smaller projects that other architecture firms just couldn't take on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think back then, uh, I was going for, um, you know, I called myself a threshold architect because I would take anything that came over the threshold. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah. and so how did you win the, your initial projects those are in those early days? And how has that, how has that changed from now? So I, I think early on, I just did networking. I didn't really have a portfolio that I was allowed to show because yeah. I couldn't show you know, work from places that I'd worked before. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I joined a few networking clubs and just started talking to other business owners. I just started, you know, kind of meeting people and getting to know the industry and talking to general contractors and meeting interior designers and asking every architect that would have lunch with me out to lunch so I could ask them about their practice and how, you know, some of the pitfalls and some of the things that they did really well just kind of learning as much as I um, possibly could. Mm. So. Well, what was, what was some of the, the lessons that you were learning from other architects as they were kind of sharing their hard work, hard won business lessons, if you like? You know, um, I would say one of the, one of the more interesting lessons had to be when, uh, you know, architects talked about how they, how clients were disappointed, right? So they would talk, about, in fact, um, one, of the, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind the most that really changed the direction of my career is I remember talking to an architect who said that, you know, he was talking about some of the things that he did that he messed up on early on. He said mm -hmm. he remembered standing um, outside uh, with his client, right, looking up at a, a design that they had done, but now the framing had been completed, and they were looking up at the pro at the product as it's being built. And the client looked up and said, "Oh, said, oh, that I didn't I didn't expect it to look like that, right?" And uh, he said, "You know, the color drained from his face, and he didn't he didn't know what to do." And uh, he said, "From then on forward, it changed the way that he presented drawings. So he mm. was doing two dimensional presentations with one still rendering, and he moved to kind of live three D. And yeah. that's part of the reason why we moved into three D is because of that conversation that I had you know, yeah. all those years ago. So um, I think it's you know it's an expensive thing." To kind of jump into you know Revit or uh, you know uh, uh, you know Archicad or Enscape and really pour time into those visualizations, but it becomes one of the more important things that we do as architects mm. is really helping our clients understand their designs. Well, this is uh, quite interesting how we take for granted our ability to read plans and sections and reflected ceiling plans let alone any other kind of technical details which become more and more like you know goldy gook if you like to a, to a client to try and uh, really pick them apart um very true when you were in the in the early days of the of the practice what was that kind of culture like of nurturing a client through the project when did you start realizing that actually the, actually the, the way that we communicate to clients is is crucial here you know i i had some experiences early on that that kind of helped me with that too right so so you know we started using like sketchup we started just kind of building models separately and and kind of showing it to them and then leaving that and going into construction documents but one of the things that I kind of found, one of the lessons that I that I learned, um, is that you kind of have to be doing that the entire the entire time you're working on the drawings, right? I mean, not just initially at those first moments of the flashy presentation of the client, but as you start to develop the details, right? As you figure out what the eaves are going to look like and what yeah. the 
uh, how the cabinetry is going to come in and uh, the nosing on the countertop, right? All of that stuff just needs to be a constant evolution. It needs to be in a language that, that clients can understand. And, uh, you know, three dimensions is what they grew up, you know, they grew up with two eyes looking in three dimensions. And so kind of living in that world in, um, in design land is, is important as well. How, how do you balance that then in kind of, do you have periods where you'll do an, an issue of three-dimensional drawings or this, uh, the 3D visualization process, or is it, like, as you say, you're kind of constantly updating a 3D model and what happens if you've got like a, a, like a heavy amount of changes to do? How do you mitigate the risk that comes along with <clears throat> a lot of investment that goes into making a, a you know, very effective Great 3D question. model? So if we were still using SketchUp, what I was suggesting would be impossible, right? right. Because, um, you know, and not to disparage SketchUp, SketchUp is a great software for visualization, sure. but, you know, basically um, what we use for our visualizations is an add-on to Revit, which is the software that we use to create the construction documents. So, so basically, um, as we are putting the construction documents together and we're putting the detail into those plans, it is automatically updating the 3D model. So we don't actually have to pour in any more time because it's automatically just coming together, right? There are some exceptions to that, right? When we're yeah. only working in 2D for the extremely fine details. But for the most part, when we make an update, when we slide a wall over or change the size of a window, you know, or even change the color of the of the wood. It's all getting updated in real time, and all we have to do is kind of click a button and and bring our clients into the uh, into the mix. So, um, and in fact, I can I can share my my screen right now. Can you see this three D yes. model here? Yep. So you know, basically, it's all it's all very live, right? So as as we are um, kind of creating the details like as as the stone cap comes in on top of a stone wall or mm -hmm. as the uh you know as we kind of develop um, where planting is on let's say a planted roof or um, as we decide when the, the stone is going to be coming inside to outside as we kind of put all of those details in they are updating the 3D visualization and we can just turn it on and, and show our clients, you know, what it is that they, um, what it is that they need to be looking at. So it's a, it's a fun thing for our clients and it is constantly updated, which makes it so that the entire process, the clients are involved and enjoying what it is that they're looking at. Do, do you ever show them a regular plan anymore? Do you need to? We do. So our process still sh still starts with two-dimensional plans. So we are still um, beginning the process by uh, basically the first several weeks, we're kind of pouring our time into the floor plan, right? While, of course, thinking of the 3D. So we're still putting the 3D model together from the beginning, but we don't actually show the 3D to our clients until they've more or less said okay to the, to the floor plan. And the okay. reason... For that is because there's just an unlimited um, number of possibilities when it comes to floor plan and elevation. Mm -hmm. And anytime we can kind of limit that, uh, limit what people are looking at and focusing them on one thing at a time, um, the, the better product we end up getting. Yeah. If we try to do everything, present every, we're still designing everything all at once. But if we started, if we really presented everything all at once, what I think would happen is, um, and I, we've done this before, and what ends up happening is if more changes, more time on our part, more difficulty turning a profit because we're continuing to design, and more frustration on the client's behalf. How, how do you then mitigate the choices the client has to make around that? Because that's very interesting what you're, what you're saying, actually, is you know we're going to keep it into, in 2D whilst we get basic things decisions made the client can kind of start to conceive of it and yes there's a risk if you go into 3d too soon that they're kind of thinking that's what it's going to look like and then you can quickly go down in the world of you're, you're doing endless permutations or optioneering for for a client to help make a decision how do you reel that back in and kind of tell the client okay you've got two options or you've got one option or do you you know do you like you know, you don't give them those options. You're like, this is the way that we want to do it. And you only. Well, 
so basically we we design in one direction so one of the re, one of the ways that we kind of enable ourselves to be able to design in one direction is before we even put pencil to paper we we have an extensive interview with our clients i mean we ask right. a thousand questions which leads to a thousand more questions um, and it makes it so that we can uh, it makes it so that we can um, really understand who our clients are before we start designing. Then we have an image review. So we, you know, usually our clients actually come to the table with pictures that they already have. If they don't, it doesn't matter. We'll bring tons of imagery to the table. We'll look at hundreds of images. We will hone, you know, we'll hone in on why they like certain pictures, why they like this versus that, right? They don't necessarily have to have an idea of what they want. They just mm -hmm. have to be able to identify oh, that one makes me feel great, or I don't like the way that one makes me feel. I don't like this for this reason, or this pot really inspired me. Or, I love this painting, right? Yeah. And all of that helps inform the design. It helps us head in one direction, right? Now, mm. it's not to say it's it's this way or the highway, because it can change, and we can head in a, a completely different direction after we present one design. But we find if we focus our energy on one design that we end up um, that we end up uh, in in such a better place at the end. We end up with a better product and um, you know uh, something that's more thought through. And you know again, we're able to charge fair rates and mm -hmm. make it so that our uh, um, so that our, our projects are profitable as well. I, I, I like this philosophy of or this this kind of to be designing in one direction and kind of keeping it that there's an efficiency to being able to to do that how do you manage that in-house so how do you manage team members not to go off onto a tangent of designing in a direction which is contrary to the one that the project's asking for what sorts you know, of mechanisms do you have in place or, or, or how does the culture work to to manage that well so we're all very involved in everything right mm -hmm. so i i see everything that heads out the door from a design perspective right? right there's nothing that that i don't have my eyes on so i still am looking at everything very closely and also i have some very key people in my office who have been with us for a long time right basically there's one she's been with us since the beginning mm -hmm. and um so she has the philosophy down she has kind of how we kind of head in a particular direction. So between the two of us, we're able to really create something that is um, uh, that is in the in the direction that the firm needs it to go in. Right. And you're right. There are tendencies to kind of head off. And he, look, I'm guilty of it too. Right. But then we always go back to the initial research. We go back to the initial data, and we we redesign in order to make it so that it's. Um, it's again, heading in, in the correct design direction. There is, um, and again, that's not to say that we design everything perfectly for the first time because we don't, that's just not how design works, but we, we know the end goal. We know where we're headed. And so even if we kind of branch off here and there on the way up to that goal, we're still ultimately heading in, in, uh, towards that goal, if that mm. kind of makes sense. Do you, do you have a kind of um, allocation for time, for example, with the rest of the team? So that you know, you may you hand it over to the project architect, and they they've got a good understanding of that. We've you know, there's X amount of hours allocated to this stage of work, or they understand that there's X amount of the budget which is allocated to this stage, so that they can kind of they've got some goalposts or guidelines, if you like, to to, to work in. Yeah. So, I mean, basically we, so we have a management software that we use, right. right. And it does everything from uh, managing time to invoicing, to accounting, to, you know, basically anything from a numbers perspective, this, this software handles. And which, so, so which software are you using? So we use a Jira. Oh, okay. Just, oh, that's masterful. That's have the, you, you've heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a good software. We we just switched over to it, and it's kind of night and day from previous softwares that we've used. So, yeah, um, you know, and it's it's fantastic because you know at the beginning of a project we lay out the time budget, and then everyone just knows, right? Everyone knows how much time they need to spend 
in order to make the, a project work for the firm. And so, you know, they, they know not to waste time, right? There's also just kind of a general feeling in the office. You know, we've kind of set up the culture so that we're efficient with our time and we're not wasting it, right? I, I remember there were, um, you know, when, when I had some summer internships, one, I, there was one firm that I worked for for a few months, which um, the culture was just kind of, you know, just design, just keep going, right, until it's finished. And <laughs> the problem, the problem with that is, I remember as a in, summer intern, I spent, God, dozens and dozens and dozens of hours detailing something that looking back should have been, you know, two, three, four hours, if mm -hmm. we were being efficient, and we were really um, and, and again, you know, the, the idea is you can spend an unlimited amount of time at honing in on something and making it better and better and better and better. But at the end of the day, if you'd spent just enough time to make it really good, not perfect, because nothing is perfect, but really, really excellent, um, then, then that's the right amount of time to have spent. Great, great. Um, so how big is the, the team at the moment? So there are 12 of us. So um, it's me. Uh, and then we have one admin assistant and the rest are um, uh, architectural staff. Great. And how quickly did that team grow? Has it been a sort of incremental, you know, person by person, sort of every year type of thing? Or was there a, a growth spurt that suddenly you, you, you'd won a lot of work and you had to build a team quite rapidly? You know, it, it kind of happened slowly. I mean, I would say it happened more slowly in the early years. We kind of started, we started with, um, you know, three people, me and two other people almost immediately, right? We, we started to gain work very quickly. But then after that, it would be about one every maybe year and a half, maybe every two years. And then, of course, people have kind of come and go over time, but we kind of kept those numbers. And then I would say as we kind of grew, it sped up a little bit, right? So um, we are now, we in the last year, we added two people. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's also a commentary on, on the current market and just mm -hmm. what's happening in architecture in, in, in general. So um, I think the biggest problem now is everyone has a job and uh, anybody who wants a job has a job. And so it's tough to find, uh, you know, excellent people at the moment. Yes, yes. I've, I've heard this from many and from all over the US that the hiring at the moment is incredibly tough. And we're even seeing scenarios where, you know, kind of wages for relatively inexperienced architects is, has kind of gone sky high. Um, double. Double. Wow. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Which, which in your perspective, does, does that, can you see this lasting or is this going to be a, some sort of bubble, which will then have a lot of upset think, at the end of it? I think we're in a bubble, unfortunately. <laughs> I, <laughs> wish, I wish I could say it would go on forever, but we've now enjoyed the longest period of, of architectural prosperity that I think has ever occurred. So uh, you know, this is, um, you know, a normal cycle is what, five or seven years and we're how long into it now? I mean, it's been growing since, since 2009, albeit slowly, but still, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, uh, what, 13 years, 13 yeah. years. I mean, that's, that's just, if you go by the amount of time, I think that, um, there's gotta be something that happens, you know, will there be a crash? I don't know. Right. But there'll be some correction. There'll be something that makes it sure. so that, you know, it changes where the um, where the demand is. So. Mm. How, in in terms of your the work that you've chosen to kind of focus your energies on, I mean, the major, uh, is it fair to say the majority of your work is still in the residential sectors? Ninety percent. Ninety percent. And have you, you you know obviously you have ventured out into other sectors? Is that mm -hmm. something that's kind of a future plan to do more commercial based work or was it, yeah. Was it been more? Yeah, I mean, we're we're I, we always like doing commercial work, but one of the things that really attracts um, me and I mean the rest of my staff, honestly, to the custom single family is the 
emotional aspect mm. to it, right? So some of the same reasons why I've, t- I've spoken to some of my colleagues and why they avoid single family residential is the emotional aspect, right? There's, there's handholding, there is um, a really understanding someone's viewpoint and feelings, right? I mean, feelings, how often does that get incorporated into architecture, right? So yeah. that's really only in the custom single family sector. And that's part of what I enjoy, right? I mm. mean, it's part of what I find interesting is, is the, is the, um, the smiles on people's faces and the, um, the emotion that people pour into their homes. So, uh, and I do, there are some commercial projects that have that as well. And those are the ones that we've tended, that we've tended towards, right? The ones that are kind of more custom and people are, are interested in creating something um, beyond kind of what is financially prudent, right? So that's, that's when we're really kind of venturing into commercial and, and multifamily and, uh, you know, hospitality and stuff like that. So well, how have your methods for winning work changed now versus 2009? So, so I would say early, early on the way we won work was by again, pounding the pavement. So we would we would go out and we would, um, you know, I, I would talk to general contractors. I would, um, you know, ask interior designers to refer us business. But as we've kind of gained a reputation over the years, we get referrals from real estate agents. Um, we give lecture. I give lectures at at real estate offices talking about how to buy and sell real estate using architectural information, and so they start to think of us now at this point. Um, and then, uh, you know, believe it or not, Instagram, right? Something that when I started, I never, it never occurred to me that we could get um, projects from uh, Instagram. But yeah, you know, we have a number of followers now, and and um, so a lot of times we'll get calls straight from the internet from people who say, "Oh, I've been following you for years, and you know, I'm I'm finally ready to do something." Great. And what's the sort of process that you put a client through to make sure that they're the right type of client? How do you know that it's, it's the right fit and what are the red flags? So that's another good question. And I think early on, I wasn't discerning enough, right? I would take on clients that maybe I shouldn't have, because I, I think really one of the most important kind of qualities of a client is appreciation, right? Mm. Understanding that they're not buying a bar of soap right? That they're, that they're hiring a human being mm-hmm. and that um, there is, uh, there's, there's more, there's a lot to architecture, right? We're essentially hanging out with our clients for, you know, years, right? I mean, it takes a long time to get something designed, permitted, and then built. And um, so having kind of that mutual respect, I think becomes important. So I'd, I'd say that's number one. Um, and then I think one of the first things, one of the first conversations I have with my clients, like right away is budget, right? When they call, I'll ask a few questions, um, just general questions about kind of you know, what they're looking for, what they wanna do. And then I say, what's your budget? How much, how much do you wanna spend on this project? And almost every single time they're surprised by the question, by the fact that I'm asking the question, like, well, aren't you just going to, aren't you just going to design it? Right. Why do you care how much it costs? Right. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to help them really make sure that they're, that they're making the right choice because if they're expecting to be able to build something for $200 a foot, those days have been gone for, you know, a decade now. So, you know, it, and so if we end up designing something and getting to that point of construction, it's a, it's kind of a disaster. So I'll say, what, you know, what's your budget? And those usually say, oh, well, I don't have one. And I'll say, oh, okay, well, if this project cost you $3 million, would you, would you feel well? And to that, you know, depending, you know, if you're talking about a small house, because I'm trying to get them to, to say something. And then they, they say, oh, well, no, no, that's not what my budget is. Oh, so you do have a budget. Okay, what's your budget? Well, I wasn't expecting to spend more than a million and a half dollars, right? Say, okay, great. So here's what we can do with that budget. And we start kind of going through it. And again, that's the first conversation. I've met them for less than 10 minutes and I'm starting to talk to them about what they can afford to to build. And 
that really helps them weed themselves out sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes they will say, well, <clears throat> you know, I need to think about this more. I need to spend more time figuring out what I really want and, and if that makes sense for me. And other times, you know, they have a perfectly excellent budget and, and we, we can kind of move forward with the next step of conversation. How do you protect your fees and, and, and ensure that you, you know, you're setting a sensible fee that's appropriate for the, for the scope and, you know, and avoid things like scope creep and the kind of unexpected expansion of what you've agreed to do. And then, Oh, how do we, how do we reclaim the fees for doing this? How do you, right. what sort of mechanisms do you have in place for, for protecting fees? So for most projects, <clears throat> we charge per square foot. Right. So I find that that's the fairest way to go for everyone, right? I think at least it feels the fairest, right? Mm -hmm. So basically per square foot, I'm basically now saying, all right, here is what we expect that we're going to design to, right? We're going to design to this level of quality. It's always a high level of quality, the highest, right? Yeah. Um, And right there, it can weed people out, right? Because we've set our price per square foot according to the level of quality that we want to deliver, Mm -hmm. not necessarily the level of quality that they want to receive. Right. Right. So it could be that they, you know, they say, Oh, well, I just need a box. Right. Then we're probably not the right architect for them because they can find someone for a fraction of what we cost to, uh, to design a box for them. Right. So what we're designing is more in depth and there's more thought and it takes more time. And we're sometimes pouring three, four, five, six times the amount of hours as somebody who would just be designing a box might put into Mm -hmm. it. So we charge per square foot and the price isn't set until after schematic design. So we set basically a a soft price at the beginning and let's say they start at 3000 square feet that's great, right? But what if we end up at 4,000 square feet? It's not really, you know, necessarily us, right? It's, it, they get to make that final decision. If we yeah. end up saying, well, look, your program says you have to put in, we have to have 4,000 square feet in order to get everything in there. Our client may turn to us and say, no, you know what? Let's reduce uh, square footage. Let's reduce scope. And so that's what we do. And then that's what they pay. At the end of the day, they get to make the call as to when schematic design is over. So they get to set the final price. Got it. Okay. And then once, once it's, they've kind of agreed on the schematic design, you've got, you've got a clear square footage and then the rest of your fees is based on that. That's exactly right. That's it's, it's, it's similar to kind of cost of construction construction. It's similar, but not quite the same. Yeah, I would say so cost of construction, there are benefits to that, too, in that, you know, uh, if they end up spending instead of $500 a foot, if they end up spending, you know, $1,500 a foot, Mm -hmm. that the architect gets compensated for that. The problem that I found with that is it usually ends up in a fight with the client (laughs) because they say, well, I just wanted this imported Italian stone as opposed to the stone in that stone yard over there. And you're not spending any more time detailing that than you would have if it were, you know, a California stone. So why, why am I paying a bunch more for you uh, to do nothing? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I found that it became a fight. So what I would say is, you know, um, you know, if, if they change, if they change scope, right. If they, if they change scope, our scope does increase per square foot, but we have kind of, again, a high level of design that we're assuming there's going to be, right? Anything from 500 to $1,500 a foot, we're still, um, we, we've still kind of prioritized the amount of time that we're gonna be spending on uh, any given project, so. So in stages of work, such as the construction uh, contract administration, for example, CA, is that still, is that like a, still that changes? That changes. So, so we include a certain number of hours. So we usually, okay. let's say on a given project, we might include 100 or 200 hours. And then if it goes beyond that, then the client has a choice to pay hourly or a monthly retainer, essentially. So um, and either is fine with us. You know, we basically size it according to how much work they're going to need 
from us at that point. Got it. Great. Um, in terms of now that the team is kind of grown, there's 12 of you, it's moving towards that sort of mid-sized practice. How has your role started to shift and change now that you've got more heads to be looking after? There's more management involved. Maybe you get less time to design. How has your role started to evolve? Well, so I'm still designing, fortunately. So, um, you know, I'm not early on. I was doing AutoCAD, right? I was actually doing some of the drafting. I'm not doing any of that anymore. So um, all of the three modeling and the, and the drafting and the, um, the hard lining and, you know, all of that gets done by everyone else in the office. And so does all of the coordination, everything, everyone in the office does all of that. What I uh, am doing now is I'm managing um, kind of the overall direction of the firm, the kind of the mission statement, making sure we're heading off in that direction. Um, and we are, uh, you know, and I'm also, um, looking over every design. So basically every design that leaves the office, we're looking at, right. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, and I'll take my pen and trace paper and I'll still overlay and overlay and we'll think through, through things together because, you know, at the end of the day, I still have the most experience with the direction of the office and how I, how I want things to go. So I still need to look things over and make sure that they're, that they're right according to the way we want the firm to go. So, um, and then I would say bringing in work, right? So I'm still Mm -hmm. talking to lots of people and going to lunches. And uh, I just gave a lecture at the Pacific Design Center um, a few days ago. So, um, you know, I'm still doing a lot of things that are bringing in work. So I would say my primary role, bringing in work to the firm, managing the staff, Uh, and overseeing the uh, design. You mentioned there as well about the mission statement and you're the the steward of that and ensuring that's kind of, you know, the direction the company's going in. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about how you developed your your vision or your mission statement for the practice and and what what kind of things does it entail or, or include? You know, our... Our kind of goals and kind of the way our firm kind of grew, it hasn't really changed at all, right? So since the beginning, um, you know, I, I worked I worked for a great architect, and this was kind of his. You know, I kind of took it from him, right? I learned I learned from kind of my mentor, and I, I've never kind of veered from it. But the concept is really simple, right? I think most architects are, um, I won't say most architects, many architects are, uh, are interested in design for, um, for the design, right? They're interested in architecture for the architecture and for the design. Mm-hmm. And while I am interested in that, and that's very important to me, I love, don't get me wrong, design is, is uh, incredibly important. What is equally important in my mind is um, is understanding the client and and making sure that that their desires and their wants and their needs are being met. So we are very very client focused at our firm. We want to make sure that uh, they feel catered to and understood, and um, that that we're listening. Right. So one of one of the lessons that I learned early on. This was when I was working for uh again that 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 architect who was my my mentor um he was telling a story of how um you know at one time he 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 had you know he took down a thousand notes from this client and one of the notes the client said i want a tv that rises from a piece of furniture at the foot of my bed Right. He said he said that. Right. And then they designed this house. It happened to be like a 15,000 square foot house. Right. And they uh, and they forgot this one little piece, which is honestly, it's not even architecture. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not even part of the architecture. It's a piece of furniture, but it wasn't noted on the plans. 
And the client said, I don't feel like you listened to me. I don't feel like you understood me. And I, and it soured the relationship for, uh, for, you know, the rest of the relationship uh, because of that one little thing that they missed. And so it's all about hearing every single little detail. And it's all about hearing um, the client understanding what it is that they want and not ignoring something that you say, oh, that's something we can figure yeah. out later or that's unimportant, right? That's not architecture. But hearing everything, that's, and that's what I would say is the core of what we're about as a firm. Beautiful. It, is the listening aspect of the profession, is this something that can be learned? Is this something that you're kind of, you're born with or it's a certain personality trait is it something that you 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 actively train your your team to get better and better at you know i think it's a little both i think you you have to kind of be born with that desire to hear people and i think empathy is huge right i think that a sociopath would have a hard time with this particular brand of architecture right yeah sure. um so i think uh, you have to be born with a little empathy and you have to really understand people's feelings and thoughts and emotions. That's key. But then I think it can also be learned, right? I mean, I think everyone uh, at some level struggles with listening, you know, in their, in their uh, business and their personal lives and everything. And it, it's, it's something that has to be fine tuned and honed throughout, um, throughout a career. So yes, we, de I definitely teach people this in my office. Um, everyone always has, uh, you know, a, a notepad in hand and is ready to uh, take vigorous notes and make sure they don't miss a darn thing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, as good as someone thinks, as good as someone thinks that their memory is, architecture is complicated. And everyone, even the, even someone with the best memory is going to forget something if they don't write it down and um, make sure that they organize it in a way where they can understand it in the future. Yeah. To, Talk a little bit about the different types of projects that you've got in, in the office. And you were saying 90% of the work is residential at the moment, but there's, you know, you've, you've also been doing hospitality and, and kind of more commercial based work. How does this listening process change there? Cause obviously sometimes with commercial work, there might be a little less emotion or you're not dealing with somebody who's actually it's, you know, it's not always their money at the end of the day. It might be on behalf mm -hmm. of behalf of a business or um, they're a project management manager. How does the, the listening aspect and how does the, the overall way that you manage and deal with clients change between the, the private residential and the commercial work? You know, I, I think it also has to do with who we attract, right? Because we're, we're typically attracting the mom and pop no matter what it is, right? So uh, we're not working for giant companies. We're not, you know, right. uh, McDonald's isn't one, of our, isn't one of our clients, right? Yeah. So we're, you know, it does change a little bit. So for instance, we're um, designing a boutique uh, hotel um, in Oceanside. And it's this great adaptive reuse project. It was this um, uh, old building that was built in, uh, I think, 19... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was wrong. Not 19, 1776. In fact, I know that because it's going to be called the 1776. I haven't thought about this in a while. But basically, 1776 is when this brick building was created. And we're trying to keep the shell... And we're putting all this steel and glass and it's going to be this great adaptive reuse um, um, boutique hotel. That's not something that I think your average developer would do. This particular developer had a passion for this and was interested in preserving this. Um, so there's still a bit of emotion there, right? At the same time, we've got to turn a profit. So it has to be financially um, prudent. So we're still asking lots of questions, getting to know the client and, and really understanding it just like we would with a residential project. Mm. Whereas with, you know, uh, let's say a larger kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, a larger outfit, they might not be thinking about that stuff at all. And that's typically, again, not who we're um, working with. So, and again, even with multifamily, there's, with this, um, <clears throat> we're doing a, another I would call it a boutique apartment complex, right? So basically uh, it's uh, 10 units 
and it is for somebody who's never developed before, but she um, wants this in investment for her future. And so, you know, again, the process is very similar to the way it is in single family when it comes to showing the design and looking at it in 3D and, um, you know, uh, but again, gathering the, the correct information. So it, it kind of all translates and it's, it, go, it still goes along with what we're all about as a firm. In terms of the delivery of the work, um, what makes for a successful team and relationship with, say, the contractor and the other, other consultants from your perspective? Communication. That's what it comes down to, right? Um, and I would, I would say that's for everybody, right? Yeah. Not, not just the contractor, but um, the consultants and the, the, um, and the client. It all comes down to properly communicating things. And I think that that's a combination of uh, great emails, but not emailing when it's not appropriate to email and picking up the phone and calling yeah. uh, and having a good in-person uh, communication. In fact, we have in our architectural agreement with our clients, a, a few sentences about communication and that we will always be available to them to communicate effectively. And we want them to also be available to us. I, we don't want just an email relationship. We want to have a, a um, complete communication and that requires picking up the phone and um, making sure that uh, everyone knows what everyone's thinking. The times when things fall apart are because everyone means well, actually, right? Everyone wants to do well, right? The contractor wants to build properly. And we want to design properly. But the times when things fall apart is when there's a communication breakdown when the drawings aren't communicating effectively to the contractor or where we're not explaining them to them or they're not asking us, you know, uh, when, when they're running into a problem, right? So we, we want to make sure that we say we're, we want to hear everything. We want anything that happens. We want to hear it. We want to be involved. And we find that that helps us uh, kind of maintain uh, not just civility, but a great relationship by the end of the project. Brilliant. What's in store for the rest of 2022? You know, we've got some really fun projects on the horizon. We've got, we've got one on a uh, cliff. So it's on That's the amazing. cliffs. Of, yeah. On the cliffs of Palisades Estates. And um, it's, you know, 120 feet above the ocean. So uh, that one's fun. Uh, and then it's going to be one story as not to block the views from people in the back, but still you have this amazing, you know, hundred and more than 180 degree view. And then we have, um, we have some great homes in Hermosa beach, uh, that are, um, looking to start here pretty soon. So we're just kind of getting contracts wrapped up and, and we're ready to start designing those. We have an awesome Pacific Palisades project that we've been pouring our heart into. So that's going to continue on through uh, the rest of this year too. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I think it's the perfect place to conclude the conversation here. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for, you know, sharing that, those, those insights and giving us a little, a little glimpse into how you communicate with your clients and, and of course the importance of that, that deep listening it's my pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed this. You're a great interviewer. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you 
conquer the world. Carpe diem.